Good morning. Today's uh, sermon passage comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. It's on page 1171 of the Pew Bible. If you could stand for reading of God's word. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you'll be rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length, height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in the Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Brother Joel. Let's pray together. On this Lord's Day, the day that all Christian churches commemorate Sunday morning early, you rose again from the dead. Lord, we gather together to commemorate that you are alive, that you are God, that you are Savior, Jesus Christ, one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And for thousands of years now, Lord, you are calling out to the darkness the gospel of light and salvation, that all who believe in Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again from the dead, are saved. Thank you, Lord, for the high and holy privilege it is to be in your gospel. If there's anyone here in the presence of this message who has not yet turned their lives over to Christ, repenting of sin, fully believing in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, Holy Spirit, I pray that you bless them this morning and draw them near. Lord God, you in the Scriptures are revealed as the one true Creator and Savior God, and you do things and you work things in ways that are beyond human comprehension. You are supernatural and yet personal. As the heavens are above the earth, So are your thoughts above our thoughts. And yet, Lord, you condescend to come to us to bring us to Christ and back home ultimately to the Father. Lord, we praise you and we thank you. What a holy privilege it is to be called the people of God and used of you in our lifetimes to continue to serve the gospel of Jesus Christ where we live and even to the ends of the earth. So Lord, I pray that you do here and now the kinds of things we see that you have done in your word and that as you work and move in your church, that you so act in ways that no human being can get the credit or the glory, but that it is abundantly obvious that you, Lord, are alive and at work, saving sinners by your grace and using saved sinners in the preaching of the gospel to do just that. And Lord, even as we have just read from Scripture, from Paul in Ephesians, as we pray, it is you, God, for your glory, who will do abundantly, exceedingly, above and beyond what we can ask or imagine for your glory in the church and in Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Today our message is on corporate prayer, greater glory praying together. Greater glory praying together. And the purpose of the message this morning is seeking God's will and glory together in prayer. We're in a summer series here at our church where Pastor Evan and myself are going through the, the, we we call it the spiritual disciplines. If you look that up at all or or you get books on that. In fact, our discipleship groups have been this whole year, different ones at different times, going through um, a book by Don Whitney, 
spiritual disciplines within the church. And it's important that we as believers, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, realize that Jesus has given us commands and teachings for how we ought to be and how we ought to live and the faith we ought to have. Uh, that's really important. Um, we, are, we are saved by grace through faith. It is not of works, not of ourselves. And at the same time, when we're saved, God is, is recreating us. Even that, that, the truth that I just quoted from, uh, loosely paraphrased from Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Saved by grace through faith, not of works, not of ourselves. And then verse 10 says, for we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. You see, God takes his fallen sinful creation and in Jesus Christ, is recreating people back to what he had intended them to be. And so we ought to expect to be transformed when we come to Christ and to live different lives when we come to Christ. And it's all about his teachings and the way we do that. And so we're, we're going through spiritual disciplines. And, and all that means is what the Bible teaches for us to grow in Christ in terms of Bible intake, reading the Word of God yourself, or expository preaching in the church when we go through books of the Bible to be faithful to God's Word, or personal prayer, which Pastor Evan preached on last week, and today the focus is on corporate prayer. But it does beg the question, where do the individual spiritual disciplines end and the corporate disciplines begin? A church made up of believers who read their Bibles and pastors who engage in expository preaching and teaching will experience the blessing of the Lord to grow both people individually and then us together corporately. The same is true for prayer. A church made up of believers who have a healthy prayer life in private will experience the greater glory of coming to know and do God's will when they pray together. I hope and pray that as, as we seek God's will and glory together in prayer, the purpose of this message today, that this is, this is a beginning, a new beginning, an ongoing encouragement to be about the Lord's work, which by the time we're done today, we're going to see a picture from the Old Covenant during the time of Solomon and dedication of the temple and into the New Covenant at, at what many people consider the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2 and how God's people in all generations are called to pray unto Him. And yes, you can pray unto Him for your own personal needs. But is there something, anything, that is particularly unique and powerful about praying together as God's people? And what should we pray for when we gather together? In preparation for this message, I was surprised at actually what came out. I mean, not really surprised. I knew it was there. I've read the Bible before. But what, what I want to alleviate your fears a little bit about, because I know you're afraid every time I speak. <laughs> just a bad joke. But what I, I want to alleviate, alleviate your fears a little bit about is this. You know, I'm not just going to stand up here for the next few minutes and, and say, y'all need to pray together. No, I, if, if, if I be faithful to God's word, we are all going to see God invite us to do something and then by faith trust him to do something we can't do. And so I want you to, as we go through the points of the message this morning, from Scripture itself, ask yourself this question. When we gather together to pray, what is it we are supposed to be praying for in terms of seeking God's will and glory together in prayer? I've heard it said, uh, the smallest package in the world is a man wrapped up in himself. And it's possible sometimes for our Christian prayer to become so self-focused, so individual-focused, so even me-focused, that maybe we might be missing the greater glory of an almighty God, the head of His church, who's working out His will in a broken and fallen world and calling His people to walk in the light and to so represent Him to the world you see, we might be so wrapped up in ourselves and our own needs. Now, please don't get me wrong. Please don't get me wrong. Yes, we should pray for people's individual health concerns. Yes, we should pray for people's individual problems in their lives. Yes, we should. But, but please let me also humbly try to say this. But if that's all we pray for, we might be missing God's greater glory. Charles Spurgeon said, Brethren, brethren, 
We shall never see much change for the better in our churches in general till the prayer meeting occupies a higher place in the esteem of Christians. Don Whitney, in his book that we are using as part of our discipleship groups, uh, has, makes some of these points just in general. Prayer with the church is a mark of New Testament Christianity. Prayer with the church brings the power of united prayer. And united prayer is linked with the effectiveness of the gospel and the church. And under that, he has these points. The preacher and his sermons need your prayer. Amen. <laughs> I looked over at Pastor Evan. We caught eyes right there. Yeah. We do. We need your prayer. And that's not for selfish reasons. When Evan and I began working together, we even talked about this a little bit this morning. It's, it's, it's a broken, simple way that I put it in my terms, but I said, boy, you know, brother, if we do this right as co-pastors and co-elders here at this church, it's going to bless the whole church. It's not about us. But if you God's people pray for the preacher, teacher, pastor, teacher, elders who are serving in this church to feed you faithfully God's Word, we will all feast on God's Word. And we'll all be faithful to God's truth. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you. See, don't just pray for your pastor. We need that too. But pray for a purpose that the word of the Lord may spread. Even the Apostle Paul asked for that prayer. Prayer should be made, Whitney goes on, for revival and reformation. Believers need to pray for evangelism and missions. And you need others to pray for you as well. So the question actually becomes, is corporate prayer important to you as a believer in Jesus Christ? And will you become an active part of the prayer life of your church? It's really possible in Western, um, westernized American culture for us to be highly individualistic. It's actually one of the marks of of Western culture is individualism. But you realize that when we, read, we, when we read the Bible, God is calling into himself a people. The church is called a body. Even, even the way Jesus taught his people to pray. I mean, did, did you ever think about this? The Our Father. And let's do that right now. If you know it, pray it out loud with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And do not lead us to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Did you notice that the pronouns in the way that Jesus taught us to pray are in the plural? Give us. Forgive us as we forgive. Lead us not. It's an unfortunate travesty of church history when that prayer was turned into just individualized sacramentalism when God's people ought to pray that together. You see? God is bringing a people to himself. What greater glory might the modern day church be missing out on because we do not gather to pray as we should? And as I move on into the message, I'm just going to front load the concept here with some opportunities we have for working together and serving together in prayer. As Pastor Evan already announced at the beginning of the service, on July 31st, we're going to have a corporate prayer, prayer and praise, we call it, prayer and praise meeting, prayer and praise fellowship. And this particular time, we are going to have a meal with it. But I'd love to encourage you to come together and pray when we do that. But what are we going to pray about? You know, I, I've kind of uh, baited the hook a little bit this morning, haven't I? 
I'm suggesting that there's something we might be missing out on, and I'm calling it greater glory if our prayers are not rightly aligned with God and his will. The 8th century prophet in Isaiah, chapter 49, verse 6, speaking about the messianic servant, writes this. He says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. 8th century B.C. Messianic prophecy about Jesus Christ. And God is saying it's too small. It's not enough that I'm going to raise up the tribes of Jacob. That's a reference to Israel. And restore the preserved ones of Israel. God wants to use and has used Israel to bring salvation to all nations. So you see, God's people, even in the Old Testament, needed a, a little bit of a focus correction. And if I use my own words, I would say, there's a greater glory to be had. Because it's not enough to just pray for ourselves and our needs and our wants and our problems and our issues. By the way, if that's the only thing we're doing, we're actually treating God like the pagans treat their idols. Because idolatry is wrapped up in the idea of how to use some kind of spirit power to benefit me, to make good luck come my way or bad luck go away. But God is not an idol, and he's not to be treated like one. He's our creator, he's our savior, he's absolute, he's sovereign. And so, again, don't hear me wrong. It's okay to pray for yourself when you have needs. It's okay to pray. I mean, are you kidding? God gives life and breath to all of us. And if you have a health need, please do pray for that. But what I'm encouraging us is, what if there's a greater glory? What if that's too small a thing? What if God is larger? What if God is more sovereign? What if God has a purpose for us and his church that we might be missing? Jesus Christ, even in Isaiah 49, it was too small a thing for him to save just Israel. Rather, he came, God in the flesh, perfect man, almighty God, to this world. They crucified our Savior on the cross. Not for any sin he committed, but for my sin and for your sin. And on the third day, by the power of God, if you recall it, according to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, God raised Jesus from the dead. So that people from every nation, tribe, and tongue, whoever believes, yes, in the Jewish Messiah, but he's also the creator of all nations and the savior of anyone who would believe in him. And this message is the message for the whole world. So what are we praying about? Seeking God's will and glory together in prayer. First, pray for all nations. All the nations. I'm going to invite you to um, have these scriptures open. I'm going to go through large, some, some large chapters of scripture, but summarize them. But you hold me accountable by having your eyes on scripture in 1 Kings chapter 8 in your Old Testament. 1 Kings chapter 8. And I just want to summarize a, a quick thought here. This is probably a, a, one of the single most amazing high points of Yahweh worship in the Old Testament, it's around 960 B.C., when King Solomon, David's immediate son, King Solomon uh, is, is giving God's blessing and permission to build the temple. And once it is built, we have the account in 1 Kings 8. It's also it's in parallel fashion, very much the same, Second Chronicles 6, of Solomon's prayer of dedication at the temple. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to explicitly find scriptures in, in the Bible that were corporate prayer where God's people gathered together and pray. Now, of course, this is the king at the dedication of the temple, but he stands up 
1 Kings 8, 22 through 26, before the altar of Yahweh in the presence of Israel and all the assembly, and he invokes 2 Samuel 7. He stands up and he says, there's no God like God who keeps covenant, keeps his promise. He promised my father David. David had blood on his hands. He couldn't build your house, Lord, but he promised my father David I could build the house, and God kept that promise. 1 Kings 8, 27 through 30, amazingly so. And boy, this is beautiful. Though the temple was built and completed according to promise, no house can be built that can contain Yahweh. Immediately at the beginning of, of his prayer, Solomon simply says, no house that a man can build can contain you. The heavens and the highest heavens can't contain you, God. Think about that. No human being can build any structure in which God can live. Think about that. And actually, you will see a refrain throughout the rest of his whole prayer where every time he beseeches God to hear from heaven his dwelling place in, in any one of these situations, there's multiple situations that Solomon prays over in front of the entire assembly, and he consistently says, hear in heaven your dwelling place, like in verse 30, here in heaven, verse 34, and forgive, verse 36. Here in heaven, your dwelling place, verse 39. Here in heaven, your dwelling place, verse 43. Over and over, at the temple dedication, I mean, isn't this cool? How much time and expense and treasure and resources to build the worship center for Yahweh and His name dwells there. But at the dedication of the human building, Solomon admits time and again, over and over, but we can't put God in this box. Towards the end, see, he goes through um, sections, forgive your people when they sin and lose in battle, 1 Corinthians 8, 33-34. Forgive your people when there is not rain, drought, 1 Kings 8, 35 and 36, forgive uh, your people and there's the words in, um, in the text are any man, any man, when there is natural disaster, 1 Kings 8, 37 through 40, 1 Kings 8, 41, and following, forgive the foreigner, this is now not Israel. So remember, this is, this is a high point of Old Testament worship. Where the temple of God, the ark is brought into the temple, the presence of God is to be there, but though he is not to live in that building because he cannot be contained in there, but his name is glorified there. And at that moment in time, around 960 B.C., verse 57, 1 Kings 8, May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us or forsake us. That he may incline our hearts to himself to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his ordinances which he commanded our fathers so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and there is no one else. Now let's back up a little bit to 1 Kings 8, 43. When the foreigner prays toward the temple here in heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you in order that all the peoples of the earth may know my name, know your name, to fear you as do your people Israel, that they may know that this house which I have built is called by your name. It, it, it does, it's, it's, it's a theological stretch. I'm going to simply, humbly say it's wrong. When people say there's no missions in the Old Testament, it's just wrong. It's not according to Scripture. This is a high point, central focus of worship in the Old Testament. When Solomon is praying before Yahweh and the entire nation of Israel, and one of the things he includes there is the name of the glory of God. And if they pray to him, he'll forgive them, is even open to the foreigners, and it's for all the nations. Did you see it? Corporate prayer. Worship. And missions. We call it missions today. 
So it shouldn't, it shouldn't strike us odd that a couple hundred years later, give or take, 8th century prophet B.C., Isaiah, he says in Isaiah 56, 7, even though I will bring, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be declared a house of prayer for all the peoples. That's Isaiah 56, 7. Now, does that sound familiar to anyone? Because it should. Because Jesus, in Mark eleven seventeen, Jesus I hope you all know this instinctively. I mean, if, if you don't know it by the sight of, of book and chapter and verse, you remember that story, the biblical truth where Jesus has to go to the temple. I'm just talking about the temple. Now we have Second Temple Judaism. We have a whole bunch of history between then and now, between Solomon and when Jesus came. So, okay, but, but we're still talking about the temple site of worship. And there's a bunch of money changers in God's house selling stuff to make profit. And Jesus overturns the tables of the money changers. You remember that story? And on the heels of that event, Jesus in Mark eleven seventeen 17 began to teach and say to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you've made it a den of robbers or a robber's den. See, Jesus drives the money changers from the temple. They thought God's house could be used to make money, but that's not its purpose. God's house is for the nations. You know, we studied pretty heavily this spring out of 1 Timothy, the household contract language in which now the church is called the household of God. There's a parallel there. So from Old Covenant to New Covenant, we no longer gather at the temple to pray, but we are now the temple. And why did God make his people his temple in which, Paul says in Ephesians, he now dwells. There's, there, there's no building we can build on earth like Solomon in which God can dwell. But the apostles teach us that when you believe in Jesus Christ and you come together as the church, that God is dwelling in the body. You. You. You're a better building than Solomon's temple. And what's your purpose, church? Like the money changers? No. Where God is, is a place for worship, prayer, confession of sin, grace and forgiveness. And then, we cannot hold that message to ourselves. God is raising up a people, his church, among every nation, tribe, and tongue of this planet. And the church does not exist unto itself. Rather, we exist for God's greater glory and greater purposes and greater will. If anyone has ever taught you that your faith in Christianity is so that you can live a better life, You've swallowed a pill and believed in a lie. Because the God of the universe who created us loves sinners so much that he came to die on a cross for our sin and by his power rose again from the dead. And the message of salvation is planted into the church so that we can take that message of salvation to all the nations. If my Christianity is just about me, then it's not Christianity. But if I understand that God and His glory and His will, His name is to be exalted among all nations, my house is to be a house of prayer for all nations. We live in a day when if you believed everything you watched on the evening news, you might have harbored in your heart or your mind some angst or, or anger against some nations in the world today that are at war. God's greater glory and greater will is that they be saved in Jesus Christ. Is this how we're praying? Because it has to be.
Because it's how Solomon prayed. And it's what Isaiah said. And it's what Jesus said. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would restore in your church a biblical vision that the gospel is the center of our church. You are the head of your church. And that the power of your gospel is the salvation for all nations of this world. Lord Jesus, if the foreigner should look to the gospel in Jesus Christ and pray to be saved, hear from heaven your dwelling place and bring them into your house. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God's greater glory, praying together. If we're going to seek God's will and glory together in prayer, we need to understand that prayer must be for all the nations. It's God's will. Secondly, we need to understand that prayer is for God's glory. This is the passage that we read um, as, as the, uh, at the beginning of the sermon in Ephesians 3. I'll just reread it again. What is God's will in corporate prayer? And I'm just going to make some quick points in this concept. Prayer for all the nations, yes, and in prayer for God's glory. Is this the way you and I pray? In Ephesians 3, 14, the Apostle Paul in the middle of the book of Ephesians, one, one of the most central, beautiful definitions of the church in your New Testament, the whole book. He says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father. Now watch. First of all, bow my knees, act of prayer, before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, Creator. That He would, see this is, God, you, God do something we can't do. That God the Father would grant you, church, according to the riches of His glory, grant you what? To be strengthened with power through His Spirit. Father, Spirit. Did you see it? In the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Christ. Do you see This is a Trinitarian prayer. Did you see it? Father, Spirit, Christ. Boom. Just like that. Do we pray with Trinitarian understanding of who God actually is? Do we pray to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith? that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints, past, present, and future, every person who's drawn near to God in salvation and knows God, that you know with them what God is like, what is the breadth and length and the height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. I, I, you want to pray that way for me, please do. I'd love that. You know, I said earlier, pray for your pastors. Pray that for me. And let me tell you something. I'm praying that for you, our church. Y'all, do we understand that the purpose is to be filled up to the fullness of God? What if the purpose is not getting a closer parking spot to the door at Walmart? What if the purpose is not immediate healing of my cancer? What if the purpose is not who wins a war between Russia and Ukraine? What if the purpose is a full knowledge and true knowledge of God in the flesh, Jesus Christ? And that is God's will and purpose. Now look at Ephesians going on 3.20. Now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask, that's prayer, or think according to the power that works within us, to Him be the glory, where? In the church and in Christ Jesus, how long? To all generations, forever and ever, amen. Do you and I pray like that for God's glory? It's okay to pray for your personal daily needs. 
but realize that the God to whom you are praying wants to abundantly, exceedingly pour out upon you so much glory that he gets all the glory. You get filled to the fullness of God. We learn who God is and what he's like, and we can't even express it or understand it fully, but that's what we're after. And that's how we ought to be praying corporately for God's greater glory. And that's greater than what house I buy or car I drive or whether or not I can make it through my next medical event. And those things, I don't want to belittle those, but I really want to belittle those. I really do. God's people, pray for God's glory. Pray for it. And then express faith and a real God, a living God, who will actually do something greater than you could even think about or pray about. And it be to His glory. We are so comfortable in America, we're scared to get on an airplane and go evangelize people in another country that doesn't have electricity or something. When our forefathers went on mission, and you know how they sent missionaries during the time of Adoniram Judson? When there were no airplanes and they had to have a ship and maybe be on ship for three months before you arrived in your country? The way they had a church service to commission and send their missionaries was they had a casket there. Because they knew they may never see that missionary again. And once they get on the boat, they're gone. They considered them dead. But it's for God's greater glory. What if we're missing out on it? Pray this way for God's will for all the nations and for God's glory. And then third, seeking God's will and glory together in prayer. Let's go to the book of Acts now. And I'm just going to list them. I think they're, they're listed there in your bulletin. I'm just going to list them and, and story through this kind of quickly. Pray for power to proclaim. Dr. Alan Tomlinson said the theme of the book of Acts can be summed up in three words. Prayer, proclamation, persecution. Uh, before the, the, the arrival of the Holy Spirit in Pentecost, at Pentecost in Acts 1 and 2, but in Acts 1, it says that the apostles were, Acts 1 verse 14, all with one mind continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. This is corporate prayer. When the Holy Spirit does infill them, and Peter preaches the Pentecost sermon one of the fruits of the Spirit as God brings 3,000 people to believe in Jesus Christ. 3,000 repented and were baptized that day. It says in Acts 2.42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. In Acts 2.46, it says day by day, they were continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. So one mind together. Interestingly, that's after Pentecost, continuing with one mind in the temple, over 3,000 people. But before Pentecost, the apostles were one mind and 114 devoted to prayer. Are we missing the greater glory because we're not unified in prayer? If we're not unified in prayer... Interestingly, Peter and John are arrested. We get to about Acts chapter 4, and they're arrested. And, and uh, they were commanded in Acts 4.18 not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. By the time you get to Acts 4.24, they were, they were released and reporting how they, they would not submit to a government's teaching that they can't speak in the name of Jesus, so they were punished and they were released. In Acts 4.24, it says, when they heard this, they lifted up their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is Thou who did make the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And they prayed together to the Creator. In Acts 4.29, Lord, take note of their threats and grant Your bondservants to speak your word with all confidence. What did they pray for when they were under persecution? What did they pray for? Acts 4.31, And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, 
And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And when they had prayed, they all went home and they stayed quiet and they didn't say anything to anybody else. Is that what it says? If someone has ever told you as a Christian that it's not your responsibility to share the gospel with other people, you drank another pill. You took another false teaching. It is our responsibility to pray for and boldly proclaim the gospel. Not just the pastor's job. Not just the missionary's job. When we gather together in corporate prayer, pray for boldness to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, I pray. I pray, Lord God, that you would wake up your church, not only our local congregation here, but your true church that meets worldwide. And because your word has taught us that you are well pleased through the foolishness of the gospel preached, the message preached, I pray, Lord, that you would fill believers, from the youngest to the oldest, men and women, new believers, seasoned believers, Fill us with a desire, a willingness, and an obedience to proclaim the gospel openly, freely, and powerfully, regardless of the circumstances in which we live. Whether we are in a free country or whether we are in a persecuted country, God, open our mouths to proclaim the gospel to a dying world. In Jesus' name I pray. If we're going to seek God's will and glory together in prayer and seek God's greater glory, we need to understand that prayer needs to be for the nations also. And again, I understand, and I probably said it a few times, I'll just say it one more time. <laughs> I understand the last thing I want to do is insult anyone who has been praying for personal needs. That's not my intention. But I am calling us to pray for something in addition to that. God's people. Pray for the nations. Like Solomon. God's people. Pray for God's glory. Like Paul. God's people. Pray for power to proclaim like our first church did. God's people, be unified in prayer. Now, I hope you heard it already in, in some of the scriptures I just read, Acts 1, 14, 2, 46, 4, 24. It's one heart, one mind. And later on, Paul in Philippians 1, 27 would write this. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. See, I'm going too fast. That's a whole sermon. Don't worry, I'm not going to preach that one right now. But listen to the Word of God. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the Gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm. This is Philippians 1.27. Imagine a Holy Spirit-filled and unified church like this, standing firm in one spirit with one mind. Now, if we stopped there, we would all probably laud that as a good value, a, a good characteristic, a good mission statement. Okay, churches should be unified. But you see, Paul didn't stop there. The last phrase in Philippians 1.27 is striving together for the faith of the gospel. The purpose of our Christian lives together is unified for the faith of the gospel. We're not unified around unity's sake. We don't compromise the gospel just to be arm in arm with each other and say, yeah, we all agree. Actually, if you have to compromise the gospel to agree, you've compromised too much. But what the Holy Spirit will do in God's people is He will unify us for the nations and for His glory and the power to proclaim and as one heart 
one mind, one spirit. We, His church, collectively are about His glory among the nations. So the conclusion is this. Biblical Christian prayer together. Biblical Christian prayer together will unify us under the will and purposes of God for His glory among all nations. Beware if there be any among you who belittle God's call to the nations. If your first thought is, yeah, but, I'm going to warn you right now that it's not the Holy Spirit. Because Solomon prayed for all the nations of the earth. The church was built upon all the nations of the earth. The gospel is to go and make disciples of all nations. In fact, Luke 24, 44 through 47 is a key central pillar verse of the entire Bible. When Jesus, on the day he rose again from the dead, appearing to the women who went to the tomb in the morning on the day of his resurrection, the two men on the road to Emmaus, and these witnesses all came back to the apostles, locked in a room, gathered, scared, because here it is Sunday, they just crucified their Savior, their Lord, their Master. On Friday, they think he's dead and gone, and he appears to them, resurrected and alive. And, he, and, he, and it says that in Luke 24, 44 through, seven, through 47, that Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures that according to Moses, the Psalms and the prophets, that the Christ would suffer and be raised again from the dead on the third day and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations. This is what God is about. And this is what his church must be about. So if you think it's about something else, you know, a lot of people taking a lot of false pills using my running illustration today. Be of one heart and one mind. Don't doubt God's will and doubt His glory. There's a greater glory to be had. Biblical Christian prayer together will surrender our individual will to His will. For His church beseeches God to manifest His glory in ways which no man can get the credit. I'm going to borrow from an author. His name is Leslie K. Tarr from the Christian History Institute magazine. I just want to share a story with you as I conclude here. Has anyone heard of the Moravian Brotherhood, the Moravian community? I just want to share a story with you. The Moravian community of a little town called Hernhut in Saxony in 1727. They commenced a round-the-clock prayer watch that continued nonstop for over 100 years. Listen to this account. In 1791, 65 years after they began this prayer watch, 1791, I mean, do I have to add in parentheses, no airplanes. The small Moravian community had sent 300 missionaries to the ends of the earth. Could it be that there's some relationship between these two facts, writes Tar? Is fervent intercession and a basic component of world evangelization? The answer to both of these questions is surely yes. During its first five years of existence, the Hearn Hut settlement showed, settlement showed few signs of spiritual power. By the beginning of 1727, the community of about 300 people was racked by dissension and bickering, an unlikely sight for revival. <laughs> Corey's parenthetical note says there, it sounds like some churches I know. Count Zinzendorf and others, however, covenanted to prayer and labor for revival. On May 12th, revival came. Christians were aglow with new life and power. Dissension vanished, and unbelievers were converted. Unity, salvation. Looking back to that day and the four glorious months that followed, Zinzendorf later recalled, the whole place represented truly a visible habitation of God among men, the temple. The spirit of prayer was immediately evident in the fellowship and continued through the, quote, golden summer of 1727. As the Moravians came to designate that period, it's what they called it, on August 27th of that year, 24 men and 24 women covenanted together to spend one hour each day in scheduled prayer. For over 100 years, the members of the Moravian church all shared in the hourly intercession at home and abroad, on the land and the sea, this prayer watch ascended unceasingly to the Lord. 
That prayer watch was instituted by a community of believers whose average age was probably about 30. Zinzendorf himself was 27. The prayer vigil by Zinzendorf and the Moravian community sensitized them to attempt the unheard of mission to reach others for Christ. Six months after the beginning of the prayer watch, the Count suggested to his fellow Moravians the challenge of a bold evangelism aimed at the West Indies, Greenland, Turkey, and Lapland. Some were skeptical, but Zinzendorf persisted. 26 Moravians stepped forward the next day to volunteer for world missions wherever the Lord led. One wonders what would flow from a commitment on the part of a 20, 20th century Christians to institute a prayer watch for world evangelization, specifically to reach those, in Zinzendorf's words, for whom no one cared. Corporately, there's a greater glory to be had when we pray. Pray for all nations. Pray for God's glory. Pray for power to proclaim the gospel boldly. Our culture has beat down this generation so much so that you think you can't share the gospel when God's word says you can. So pray for it and then do it. Pray. Unified. It's too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation will reach the ends of the earth. We asked at the beginning of the series if you expect to grow this summer. If you expect to grow in your personal Bible study, if you expect to grow in the study of God's Word, do you expect to grow in your personal prayer? And do you expect to grow in corporate chair? Cor excuse me, corporate prayer. And will we as a church also just grow into what God is calling his church to be and do? And I praise God. I, I, I'm fearful many preachers, when they stand up, they can sound condemning or critical. I believe God is already doing these things that I'm talking about. But I know that from Ephesians 3, that God can do and answer those prayers exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond whatever we can ask or imagine. So if God has begun something here, then I want him to do more and more and more and don't stop. Because God can use a ragtag group like First Baptist Church of Bettendorf to reach the nations for Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus, this is what I pray for. Lord, in our own minds, and we believe you've led us to this, we have structures, we have ideas. I thank you for them. But Lord, do more abundantly, exceedingly beyond what we're asking. I thank you, Lord, for adults on mission here at our church. And I pray, Lord, that you grow that ministry I thank you, Lord, for our discipleship groups that are adopting missionaries and communicating with missionaries to be part of the gospel going out to the nations. I thank you, Lord, for royal ambassadors and girls in action, where we teach our children about the Bible and about the mission. Lord, I thank you for your word for your church. And I thank you, Lord, that, that the power and ability is not in us. But you, in your church, can do abundantly, exceedingly, beyond what we ask or imagine. And you've already commanded us to go and make disciples of the nations. We have missionary forefathers and foremothers like the Moravians and so many more. God, we have ample, all that's necessary, all sufficient truth in your word and we have your spirit to sustain us as we go. We have your promise, Jesus, that you will be with us to the end of the age. So I pray that our prayers would be according to your will and for your glory so long as you give us 
life and breath, that we would so serve your kingdom. If there's anyone here who has not yet given their lives to Jesus Christ, I pray that they would believe in Jesus who died on the cross for their sins and rose again from the dead. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. Lord, I pray that we, Your people, together be about Your gospel. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.